I need to bring up all the general merriment happening, uh, but uh, I'd like to welcome you all to our spring 2019 economic update. Uh, as you can see, we've, we've switched a few things up. Uh, we've, we've got the round tables, which I told that I approved, so I'm glad that's working out. Um, and then, of course, uh, due to uh, various feedback and only the occasional death threat, we decided to have wine during rather than after. So we're killing that because that is never. Um, so hopefully you enjoy it. Uh, we've got a great program. That's something that hasn't changed uh, with Ted and John. And so without further ado, I will hand the mic over uh, to John for his four hours. And then, and then Ted's got another, what, two, three? So that's why I got the wine during. But anyway, here's John. Thank you. I'm fully capable of filling four hours, um, but I won't. Um, thank you all very much for coming. It's a special economic update um, because this is the year of Baker Boyer's. Wait for it. 150th anniversary. So the sesquicentennial, right? Yeah. Um, I even learned the word for 175th anniversary. I don't know, Dr. Quinn, yeah. yeah. Watch out for it. Anyway, a really special year for us. Um, so, you know, for uh, 150 years ago, uh, we started before Washington was a state um, in, you know, serving local entrepreneurs, multi generational family businesses, individuals like all of you. So, really a tremendous legacy. Um, and really owing to two things, the creative vision of our founders and of the insight and expertise of many of the employees that you see in the room today. And when we think about the, the founder of the bank, Dr. Dorsey Singh Baker, you know, many of you may know something about his life, but a fascinating guy, a serial entrepreneur and philanthropist, um, not in addition to starting the bank, he started a mercantile, a shipping company, a railroad, um, and donated all the land, of course, where uh, Whitman College currently resides, um, and numerous other you know, civic causes. And that, that entrepreneurism, that philanthropy has continued for six generations of family leadership. So, um, you know, just a tremendous, I think, accomplishment, um, and it's all made possible by all of you. So, you know, we thank you for that. Um, so you'll, you'll be seeing, uh, you know, celebrations throughout all of the communities that we serve of this sesquicentennial year. Um, so, and, and as we go through the, the presentation, feel free to get up and get a little more wine as this is a new format. Um, you know, feel free to get more food and more wine as we go. So today, my job is gonna to be to cover the, the global economy and Ted Cohan, who of course is uh, you know new to the bank and not new. Of course, Ted has been with the bank for 15 years, took a hiatus with the school district for five years and is now with us as a portfolio manager. Ted is going to be talking about markets, uh, volatility, and asset allocation. So I'll be really co covering the context and Ted covering the markets. When we talk about economics and we talk about markets at the same time, one of the most important things is to understand the relationship between the two. And often an analogy, I think, is a good way to understand those complex relationships. Um, and one of the best, I think, most interesting uh, analogies that we can come up with is a man walking a dog in the park. So when we, when we look at the man, the man, there's nothing exciting about the man. The man is taking, he's walking at a moderate pace. He's going to his favorite coffee shop, taking normal steps. And then if your eye glances down to the dog, of course, what do we see the dog doing? Never walking, you know, in a well-behaved manner like these two dogs. Typically, it's more like, you know, Jack Russell Terrier. It is digging up every bush, sniffing every tree, running back and forth, typically in front of the man. Now, generally speaking, because of the leash, the man and the dog are going generally in the same direction. But if your eyes glance down from the man and you look at the dog running to and fro, can you say anything about the man's direction by looking at the dog? No. I think you probably all know where I'm going here. The man is the economy, the dog is the stock market. 
So I'm going to be covering the man, Ted will cover the dog. <laughs> and when we think about uh, the economy, you know, and often when, we, when we're preparing for these economic updates, it's a challenge, right? We need to cover the global economy in 20 minutes. It's an impossible task, so we need to distill it down. And how do we do that? How do we pick the subject? And typically it comes from client questions. So what are our clients currently concerned about? And I think one of the most popular questions today is, when's the next recession? And why is that one of the most popular questions? Well, because we are a couple months away from having the longest global economic expansion in our country's history. So we're at 117 months of expansion right now. Um, so you know, the natural thing to say is we're due for a recession, right? A recession will come. And that's true, it will come. But expansions don't die of old age. Um, and so we really need to look at, and one of the things that's exacerbating, I think, that fear is the fact that some of the major economies in the world, in fact, the global economy, is projected to slow. So we should have slower rates of economic growth, still growing, but growing at a slower pace. So if we look at the world, over here on the left-hand side, the three numbers you see, this is the actual economic growth, so 3.7% of the global economy in 2018. 2019 projected to slow to 34 that may not seem like a lot, but of course it's on a very large number. Um, and then still not getting back up to 3.7 for 2020. And then if we look at what's driving that, primarily it's three areas, the US, the Euro area, and China, three largest economies. And if you look at projected economic growth, it's slowing quite a bit. Now, I can't go into great depth in all of these economies, so I'm going to focus on the US and China, and we're going to tease out some of the top lines of the stories about what's causing that slowdown, and is it you know, kind of suggestive that we're, we're the first step toward recession? And I think what you'll find is the answer is no. So I was a soccer player when I was young, and as soon as I finished playing soccer, my way to stay in shape was to run. And 20 years ago, I ran farther and faster than I do today. Today I run slower. Today I run less frequently. Um, my, uh, and I think most importantly, I just feel like I'm a whole lot more vulnerable to injury. And many of you may know what I'm talking about. So I actually visited the chiropractor for the first time in my life two weeks ago. Um, so if we think about the economy as an aging runner, right? we're going at a slower pace today than we used to. In many ways, that slower pace makes us a little bit more vulnerable to shocks. Right? So we're, in part of my talk today, I'm going to talk about how I don't think we're going to be entering into a recession. Now, recessions are notoriously difficult to forecast, but if we look at um, where we normally see excesses that lead to recessions, we're simply not seeing those today. Um, but we are moving at a slower pace we are more, more vulnerable to shocks, and so we have to be prepared for that. If we look just and take a bit of a deeper dive into the US, this is looking at quarter to quarter growth from the fourth quarter of 2017 through the first quarter of 2019, and this is a projection. Now, you can see that it's a pretty precipitous decline from quarter to quarter from the middle of 2018. Now, if we look at this decline, you, you know, you'd be forgiven for saying something's going on there. Something is wrong. You know, there's something wrong with the economic fundamentals here. So what is happening? And I think it's pretty clear that most of that decline in the pace of growth comes from the the tapering effects of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. So when, when uh, taxes, tax rates were reduced on corporations and, and some individuals, um, the net effect on the economy was in 2018 to add about three quarters of a percentage point to growth, knocking us up over 4%. In 2019, it was expected to be about two tenths of a percent. This is a little bit lower than it probably would be without the government shutdown. That took some, some points away. And then it's expected to lag. You know, and if we're you know, using an analogy, this is akin to you know, giving your child a candy bar. 
right? You see that spike in activity, and then of course the sugar crash follows. And that's essentially what we're seeing. So are there problems with the economic fundamentals in the United States, or are we simply returning to what is trend growth? So the potential growth of the US economy. And I would argue it's the latter. And here are some of the reasons why. So you know, we do believe that recession is unlikely. The two major drivers of the US economy are the consumer. So 70% of the economy comes from consumer spending. And some you know, significant chunk of the remaining 30% comes from business activity and business investment. So if we look at some of some just statistics to judge the health of those two sectors, um, I think we can get a sense that right now, the US consumer and US businesses are in fairly good shape. The, the, um, and before we look at these numbers, just confidence levels of US consumers are at relatively high levels. So the US consumer is relatively confident today, and it may have to do with some of these numbers. So the personal savings rate, in 2008, Q4, at 6.1%, that's up. If we look at, for example, debt service ratio, and this is a fancy way of saying, of your income, what percentage goes to paying down debt? And right now, that's you know from uh, fourth quarter of 2008, 12.8%, it's dropped to 9.9. And we'll look at that in a global context in just a moment. And credit card delinquency rate falling quite a bit suggesting again that there's some help in the, for the U.S. consumer. Now, debt service, this is one thing that you know, really makes the U.S. consumer quite resilient. And this comes from, uh, you know, we can see all the way back to 1980. And again, this is the percentage of U.S. consumers' income that is going to pay debt. This does not say, by the way, that aggregate levels of debt are down. Right? It's saying that the, what we have to make in payments on our debt is down. And why would that be? Well, I think you probably all know. And that has to do with the fact that we had record low interest rates you know, coming out of the recovery. And many of us took our largest debt, our home, refinanced it at very, very low rates. Um, and, and the effects of that continue to this day. So you know, the lowest levels of debt service we've seen in 40 years. And it makes you know, a tremendous impact on the resilience of the U.S. consumer. If we look at the uh, business uh, sector, um, you know, one of the, the things that I think really challenged economists as we were coming, one of the big question marks coming out of 2008 was why is this recovery so slow relative to other recoveries from other recessions? And one of the things that was really missing was business investment. And why was that business investment, why did it take so long to get that recovered the way we've seen in past recessions? Well, it really had to do a lot with what's called capacity utilization. So if you think about um, a company's property, plants, and equipment, all those things that they use to produce what they produce, well, coming out of 2008, they laid people off, they shuttered factories, so their capacity utilization, the amount of all that, that stuff, that property, plant, equipment, the amount they were using was, let's say, 50%. Well, they're not gonna need any more until they use what they have. So that needed to rise all the way up to closer to 90%. They needed to use what they already had before they invested in more. And it's taken us a long time to get up to high capacity utilization rates to where now businesses are looking to the future and they're saying, to satisfy future demand, I need to build another factory. I don't have enough capacity. And that's what we're seeing here, is an increase in that fixed investment, right, in, in capital, uh, capital goods. And if we look at earnings, earnings of US companies, so this is the operating earnings per share of S&P 500 companies, and they're at record levels. Um, we had a, a bit of a soft fourth quarter, but it's been, you know, estimates are that we're going to get up to record levels again this year. Um, so very, very high levels of earnings. And if we think about what this means, um, particularly as it pertains to the consumers we talked about earlier, you know, it means that there is room for wage increases um, for these companies. Um, and there's other reasons that we can't go into right now. 
But uh, it's important to note that there is capacity in these corporations to increase wages. So taken as a whole, economic fundamentals in the United States, looking at those two drivers, the businesses and the consumers, relatively healthy. So if we change our focus to China, um, you know, I, I think this slide is self-explanatory. <laughs> so this is it's a, it's a, a well-known Chinese idiom um, in China. Uh, it's, it, it, it means crossing the river while feeling for stones. And this was a saying that Deng Xiaoping used in the early 1980s to describe the path of economic development in China. And essentially what he was saying was, as, you know, as the, the leaders of this emerging nation, we know where we need to go across the river. And what did that mean in economic terms? It means they need to take what is an agricultural economy and become a manufacturing economy, and then become an economy that is based on, or primarily based on, consumer consumption and services, the way the United States is, and somewhat in insulated from all of the, the volatility that comes with being an export-led economy. So he knew that was the case. And if we look at the path of Chinese development, whether it was political or economic since that time, it has been this process of uh, stimulating and then controlling the effects of that stimulus, right? Tamping down the growth. It was a little bit more political freedom and then Tiananmen Square, right? pulling it back. A little bit more and then pulling it back. Always keeping control, right? Crossing the river while feeling for stones. And that's really been the path of Chinese development. And I think what we're seeing, if we're going to explain the, the slowness in their economy today, it is that exact same pattern that we're seeing. So this is just looking at their uh, real growth rate. So their, you know, their, uh, the growth rate of their economy, you can see indeed it is slowing. Um, you know, the, the rate of growth that we see right now, the low 6% range, is the slowest we've seen in 30 years in China. So. Um, and this, this, there's some cause for concern. People are looking at this and saying this, coupled with the slowdown we're seeing in the U.S., seems like it's one more step toward recession. So let's you know look under the hood and see what we see with the Chinese economy. So in, before we talk about uh, the, we just want to talk about the structure of the Chinese economy. And I think this is something you know we talked about you know going from stone to stone, agrarian society, manufacturing to services led. Well, the old Chinese economy is on the left-hand side. Now, this still represents a large part of the Chinese economy, um, but a minority now, something along the lines of 40%. Um, and this is the old industrial economy. A lot of state-owned enterprises with very well-established links to state-owned banks. So easy access to credit. Whenever the Chinese government wanted to stimulate the economy when it was slowing, they just said to the Chinese, the state-owned Chinese banks, hey, you know, start lending more. Lend to these old industries. But this is the new Chinese economy. And this represents the vast majority of growth in China. And this is, when I, when I say this, this is a consumer-based economy, service-based economy. This is 80% of employment. So this is the future of China. Right? And it also insulates them like the U.S. Um, so what we've seen in this slowdown is actually, um, but the, I should say the linkages between the consumer and access to credit is much more difficult for these, because these are small and medium-sized businesses, they're family-owned businesses. In China, they don't have the equivalent of Baker Boyer in a small town providing access to credit for these businesses. They're reliant on the state-owned enterprises. So what we see here, the black bars, again, that's, that's uh, economic growth. It's, it doesn't look like the other chart because it's nominal. But I want you to focus on that, uh, that blue line. That blue line is the growth in credit outstanding. And so what you see here, and again, crossing the river while feeling for stones, when the economy began to slow here, what did we see the Chinese government do? And this was in 2008. They expanded uh, access to credit, right? They flooded businesses with money to encourage investment. 
And all of us should be thanking the Chinese leadership today for what they did in 2008, because they were key to you know, preventing a, a, a deeper uh, crisis at the time. Then we saw um, this period of trying to rein in credit growth. And then we saw it again, spike here. Now here, this is important, this spike in credit growth, that was mostly to those small and medium-sized businesses I was talking about. Which is really great, because that's the, that's the part of China that really needs to grow. It's the most dynamic part of China. And it, it employs 80% of their population. Um, but uh, the challenge in this growth is this was all shadow banking. There's a lot of shadow banking, completely unregulated. And the Chinese government felt, you know, and, and debt levels were getting very, very high. So it made the Chinese government very nervous. So in, you know, it was quite prudent. They restricted, they wanted to really stamp out Chinese or shadow banking. But shadow banking was a source of credit to this part of the economy that was very important. So what they've done very recently, in fact, they announced it in January, that they're going to be requiring all of the, the state-owned banks to uh, lend one dollar in every three to these small and medium-sized businesses in the private economy. Um, so to encourage that access to credit. Now there are challenges with that. Again, they're feeling, feeling for stones as they cross the river. But if we look at you know, what's causing that slowdown, it is that squeeze in credit of this unregulated sector of the Chinese uh, economy. So in some ways, some prudent policy that suggests more state sustainable growth in the future. And if we look at the, the Chinese consumer, you know, by and large, incredibly healthy, um, and when we look at, you know, in spite of some softness recently, because again, their employment was primarily in the small and medium-sized businesses where access to credit has been constrained. So there's been some softness in spending, but incredibly high savings rates. And they, if we look at just some of these statistics, between now and 2030, Chinese ex consumption is expected to grow by $6 trillion. Now that is more than the growth of U.S. consumption and consumption in Western Europe combined in that period, and more than double what we expect to see in India and the ASEAN countries. So just a tremendous um, consumer consumption story um, and, and the, the, the potential for growth in that consumer and services-led areas is huge. So I've really, in some ways, laid out the idea that in some of these major economies, the, the slowing growth that we're seeing is in some, it's, it's not necessarily a step toward recession, right? It's slowing to what would be more sustainable and trend growth, but it is slower, right? And if we look at the Chinese path that they have to cross, um, it's, it's challenging, right? There are risks there. Um, I'm gonna focus my remaining comments on a couple of other things, these last three. Now, some of you may be wondering, when is he gonna talk about the Fed? Um, well, now. And the other thing is, what about Brexit? Um, isn't that something that we need to discuss? And the answer is yes, and we'll talk about that as well. Um, so I'll just talk about this Fed response to an upside inflation surprise, limited scope for monetary and fiscal policy. Gosh, reading these, these sound incredibly exciting, don't they? I'll try to make them exciting. And the populism gain sway in the trade debate. So with the first one, just talking about a potential Fed surprise to an upside inflation surprise. What do I mean by that? If we look at this chart, you can basically see that, you know, in these groups of numbers, they're declining. And each of those are, so these darker bars, oops, these dark bars, this is the Fed's assessment of where the Fed funds rate would be as of March of 2018. The next column is their assessment of June of 2018, September, December, and March. And this was their assessment of where they would be in 2019, 2020, 2021, and the longer run. And what we can see is just a clear pattern that at every one of those stages, the Fed was, was believed that rates would be lower. Right? So we're seeing this decline in where they, they thought that the longer run, run rates would be. Now, just in, uh, in January, uh, Chairman Powell came out and said that he thought that, that it was very unlikely that you were going to see more than, or see the, the pace of rate increases we were, that they were projecting. It would be much slower. 
Um, and I think the market, you know, has rallied a lot on that news. Ted will talk about this, right? And the, this, this assumption is that the Fed is going to stay pretty flat. And that was very supportive of the market. If there is a surprise in inflation, and right now we're seeing fairly strong wage growth, we're seeing corporations with the, with the room to move wages higher. We're seeing a very tight labor market. Could there be an upside inflation surprise? There could. And well, how the, would the Fed react? Well, they would likely raise interest rates. That could be destabilizing for the market in financial markets. And we think that that's actually an unlikely scenario and that this is probably the more likely scenario. And that's that we get the next move is down, not up. Now, if we look at this line right here, that's the Fed funds rate going back to 1999. When this line goes down, that's the Federal Reserve reducing interest rates, stimulating the economy. When this line goes up, that's the Federal Reserve tightening interest rates and trying to cool the economy. So this is right after the tech bubble bust when we went into recession. This is the attempt to stimulate the economy. This was Greenspan desperately trying to cool the housing market in the United States. And many of you know that story. He was unable to do it. And of course, 2008 followed. And then this was this unprecedented low rate environment. We've climbed up some since then, and we find ourselves here with the Fed believing that rates will likely one more interest rate increase is what they're saying sometime in the next two years. Whereas the market doesn't believe them. The market thinks that the rates will go down. Typically in a battle of the market versus the Fed, the market has won. So it's entirely possible that the next rate move will be down, not up. What is the risk in that? Well, the risk that we see in this picture is that in a period of economic weakness when we would normally support the economy with monetary and fiscal policy, we don't have as much scope as we have in the past. So if we look at this decline, this was roughly you know, a little over five percentage points. We look at this, five percentage points. And on average, if we look further back in history, roughly five percentage points is what that decline was to stimulate. We simply don't have that. We have the constraint of the zero lower bound. So there's limited scope to engage in you know, meaningful monetary policy. Now QE, this quantitative easing, right, buying bonds, still on the table. Um, and if we look at Europe and Japan, well, they're in, in a tighter spot than we are. And they even have less scope for monetary policy. The other challenge is um, with uh, fiscal policy. So in the United States, you know, what is the potential that we'll get you know, the two political parties agreeing on exactly how we respond? There are challenges there. And if we look at um, Europe, Europe has, you know, within the, the EU rules, as per the Maastricht Treaty, um, there are certain debt level rules. So, you know, fiscal accommodation, government spending, right, is actually prevented by the rules to a certain level. In fact, if they, their balance sheet gets too weak, they need to engage in fiscal contraction. Um, exactly the opposite thing. So just the scope broadly of fiscal and monetary policy is somewhat more limited than we've seen in the past. So the last thing I'll talk about is just uh, integration versus fragmentation. I think it would be hard pressed for someone to argue that the global economy hasn't been incredibly well served by trade over the last, you know, call it 70 years since the end of World War II. Um, there are gains from trade. Right? The extreme example, of course, is if you look at a closed economy like North Korea. Right? There are not the efficiencies there that allow for those gains from trade. It's complicated, though. And it's complicated for this reason. If we look at emerging market economies, it doesn't matter who you are. When you engage in trade, you're likely to benefit from that trade. In advanced economies, it's a little more complicated. Right? The disruptions can be a little bigger. I think this cartoon does a good job of illustrating that, where the US Chamber of Commerce is likely making the argument that I'm making right now that hey, whoa, there's gains from trade, right? You know, please, Mr. Trump, or President Trump, don't engage in this tariff war. Uh, but of course, China at the same time is eating our manufacturing sector, right? So the gains from trade typically come from 
uh, the, the disruption that comes through innovation, right? So people going into areas where they are more competitive, right? But in order, but there are winners and losers in that economy, right? And um, in order for this to be uh, not to cause the political disruption that we've seen, we've got to have the, the people who lose from trade, who are disrupted, retrained so that they're competitive in the economy going forward. That's really the, the key. Um, but what we're seeing now is that this populism, this sort of increased you know, tendency for fragmentation, not integration, um, is gaining some traction. Um, and right now, we need every bit of productivity and efficiency we can get with slowing growth. Uh, to summarize, you know, our base case is essentially that there is very likely to see a recession in the near term, um, and there will likely be elevated potential for growth scares. Again, this is the aging runner who's more vulnerable to shocks. So every time we see a, a number come out that's not as high as we had hoped, people say, oh, you know, and we might see some market correction off of that. So maybe a little more volatility. Um, and then the slowdown in many areas due in part to demographics, that's the longer term trend. Um, but some of these things more short term, return to trend in the US, um, prudent policy in China, and uh, some political uncertainty and trade issues that we're seeing in the UK and uh, in Europe. And the risks to slower growth, again, limited scope for policy support, you know, the, the spreading of, you know, more fragmented or fragmentation type uh, policies, so trade tensions that come. Um, and all of that, meaning that it's very likely that we have the potential for repricing of risk. What does that mean? That means some, some volatility. And that's really what Ted is going to come up and talk with us about. Thanks, John. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about, as John said, talk about the market. So we're going to do a review of the fourth quarter of 2018, look at what's happened so far in 2019, also do about a 10-year look back, just because the last um, really down market we had ended in March of 2009, so we have 10 years of numbers now to look at. Talk about volatility, now the volatility we're having right now really is normal, and nothing to worry about, so we do get that question quite a bit. And then we're going to talk about asset allocation, and how does Baker Board look at asset allocation, and what, if any, changes are we recommending right now. So this is the wonderful summary of the fourth quarter of 2018. When we last did the economic update in October, the market was actually positive for the year at that time, and it really kept that up through most of November. Most of this sell-off really happened in December. Uh, there wasn't really any big economic news. Uh, it was mainly trade wars was in the news quite a bit, talking about tariffs. And then also at that point, when we would have met last time, when we talked about the Fed, as John mentioned, we would have expected probably two rate increases in 2019, which is not good for the market. The market doesn't like that. And so again, for, for the fourth quarter of 2018, the U.S. market was down 14.3%. International developed stocks was down 12.78. Emerging markets down almost 7.5%. And bonds, uh, both U.S. and global, were the only thing that was positive for the fourth quarter. What this ended up doing for 2018 is made it a very unusual year. And what this chart shows is on the left is kind of all the major asset categories that most people would invest in. You know, U.S. large cap stocks, small cap stocks, uh, international, both emerging markets and developed, several different categories of bonds, and then also gold, commodities, so majority of investment categories. And in most years, as you can see, the green is when markets are up, there's always some place where you can invest that it makes money. 2018 was the first year in about 25 years that every category essentially was down except for cash. So a very unusual year, 2018, essentially there was no place to hide. Uh, now 2019, of course, has taken off quite well, and this, this slide here is through March of 2019, but here is the full uh, first quarter of 2019. And again here, we didn't really have any huge economic news besides the combination of the Fed, so the Fed went market neutral, and actually the market believes again that the next interest rate increase, or not, will not be an increase, will be a decrease, which the market likes. And then President Trump at one point came out and he said he thought the trade war would, would end by March, which it has not, of course, but that helped the market uh, the first part of the year. So the U.S. market was up a little over 14% for the first quarter. International was up 10.45 for developed, and emerging markets was up just under 10%. And then both the bond markets did very well because, again, 
neutral rates or decreasing rates are good for current bond markets, so they were up close to 3%. And then when we get to volatility, the volatility that we're seeing really is fairly normal, and this goes back from 1979 to 2018. And what this shows is the dark blue lines represent how the S&P 500 ended the year in any given year. What the black line represents is the highest point of where the market was for the year, and the red is the lowest where it was for the year. And so essentially what this represents, back to John's analogy, is this is the dog, kind of all over the place, really not knowing exactly where the, where the market's gonna go or where the dog is going. Even if we know economic news is still pretty good, we can't control where the market does day to day or month to month. And so in most given years, we really have a 30 to 40, sometimes even a 50% swing you know, in up and down markets throughout the year. And even if you look from 2009 on, pretty much every year, except for 2018, ended the year positive, but every year had at least a 10% down market, a lot of them a 20% down market at some time, other than 2017, which is a very unusual year and had low volatility. The other thing to remember when we talk about volatility, if anybody watches CNBC, listens to news channels, they love to kind of overemphasize what's happened in the market. And so, you know, when you look at a Dow of 26,400 today versus 20 years ago, when the Dow was at 6,000 or 8,000, they make it seem like a 200 down day is the same as it was 20 years ago. Well, it's not. And so when you look at the percentages, two, three, 400 point up and down you know, days in the market, is really very normal and nothing to worry about. So then long term, we talked about the last economic you know, uh, recession and downturn in the market was 2008, ended in March of 2009 was the bottom. And so since then we have 10 years of data where the US market has, has been up an average of 16% per year over the last 10 years. International developed markets is up 8.82, emerging markets is up close to 9%. And then the bond market, U.S. and global, have done pretty much what we would expect, just under 4% and a little bit over 4%. Uh, the interesting thing is the U.S. market versus international, it has done way more than double because it's, again, 16% per year versus 9% per year on the international. So then we're going to get into a discussion of asset allocation. And so when John and I and our team sit down and talk about asset allocation, kind of that first step we look at is stock versus bonds. Where do you want to be in our mix? And so... Um, typically, I'm going to talk about a core balance model just because that's our most common model for, for our clients here at Baker Boyer. And so in a core balance model, we typically have stock between 55 and 65 percent. We keep bonds between 35 and 45 percent, depending on market conditions. Um, and so about four years ago, we were up to 65 percent in stocks, which did very well and benefited us for a few years. About a year and a half ago, we moved that equity position down to 61 percent. And what we're doing right now is moving that to 58%. So a core balance model is going to be 58% stock, 42% bond. If you're a little bit more conservative investor, we'll probably switch that 1% or 2%. If you're more aggressive, we might make that switch about 4%. And really the main reason is when you look at a return of 10 years at 16% per year, and even an international market of 9% per year, that's an amazing return. We don't expect that return to continue out for the next 5 or 10 years. And so I think it's a good time to take some profits. We still consider 58% on the core balance model to be fully invested. Um, we always recommend staying fully invested. And again, because of that volatility slide and essentially you know, the, the dog analogy, we don't know where the market's gonna go. What we do know though, is that over time, the market is up a lot more than it is down. And so what this slide represents is from 1926 through 2018, returns on the US market and 74% of the time you have positive years, 26% about one fourth of the time you have down years. And also when you have up years, each box here represents an up year. And this is a zero to 10% range, 10 to 20%, 20 to 30 and so forth. So you have a lot more up years and down years and usually bigger up years than down years. And so we always want to keep you invested in the market. So look at this a different way. This is using a 20% threshold for downturns for the S&P 500. And again, what this shows is the last correction we had was back in the 2008-2009 area. We were down 51%, and not a lot of fun to have that, and that was a painful time, but it's a very short time, 16 months, and since then we've been up 338% for 106 months. So it's kind of another good reference to look at is really what happened in December and January. You know, if you were in December and you were in the market, 
by the end of December, because really the last big sell-off was Christmas Eve. We were down about 600 points that day. If you just said, okay, I've had it, I get out of the market, I, I can't deal with this anymore. Well, then January comes, and January does nothing but go up. Mm -hmm. By the time you feel better, it's probably the end of January when you decide to reinvest, and you've just missed 11 or 12 percent up, up market. Um, so again, that's what we always recommend: you stay invested in the market. One last slide, just to sort of beat that to death here, is this is uh, you know reacting can hurt performance. Performance of the S&P 500 from 1990 to 2018. This is assuming that I put a thousand dollars into the S&P 500 in 1990 left it in the whole time, I end up with $13,000. My uh, annual you know, return is 9.29% per year. And this represents about 7,000 days in the market. If I miss just the one best day, I lose a half a percent. And if I miss 25 days, the 25 best days out of 7,000, so just a small, small fraction of 1%, my return gets cut in half from 9.29 to 4.18. So we just don't know when that volatility is gonna strike when we're going to have a 500 point up day or down day, um, but in this case we're looking for the good days, obviously. <laughs> so then after we look at kind of that first step of what do we want to have for stocks versus bonds, then the next thing we got to decide is, okay, well within that mix, do we want to make any changes? And so one of the big ones we always look at is in the U.S. stock side and international stock side is value versus growth. And we always are going to invest in both value and growth, but we believe in the value tilt long term. Well, that means is that value company stocks about 80% of the time outperform growth stocks. And if we look at an, an historical number in this line here, from 1928 through 2018, invested in U.S. large cap value stocks outperformed growth stocks by 3.3% per year uh, over the developed markets at 5.1% per year and emerging markets 3.66 per year. And again, that's about 80% of the time value outperforms in any given year but historically over the long period, value has done better than growth. But what we have seen over the last 10 years is that we've seen a time when growth has actually outperformed value. And so over the last 10 years, investing in value minus growth is actually down 4% compared to growth in the U.S. market. International uh, developed, it's still up, but not as up as it was, and emerging markets is down. And so that gives us even more confidence that moving forward, value is the place to be, and especially when, as John talked about, the global economy is slowing a little bit, typically in these types of environments, that's when people really want to go to companies that have more earnings, more dividend paying type stocks, which are your value stocks. And this last slide just shows the historical observation of the 10 year premiums of value versus growth. Uh, blue is represents all the 10 year years when value has outperformed growth. Red is when growth has outperformed value. So the last couple is at the end of 1999 area when we had the tech, uh, tech really taken off, value really did very well from then, and then from 2009 on, again, we have seen that outperformance and growth. A lot of that led by technology and the FANG stocks, you know, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. And again, we invest in growth, we just have a value tilt, and we're not gonna change that moving forward because we believe value is still a place to be. And this is the long-term market summary again. And I have this up here again because then the, another thing that we always have the debate is, well, what, what mix should we have of U.S. stocks versus international stocks? Um, so we choose our equity portion. So like in a core balance, we choose we're going to be 58% invested in stocks. But then we've got to decide, well, of that 58%, what percentage do we want to have in international and what percentage do we want to have in the U.S.? And so again, just looking at that 10-year summary, what we've seen is the U.S. stock market has significantly outperformed the international market. If we look at that a different way, you know, over five decades of returns, what we've seen in the 1970s and 1980s, international stocks significantly outperformed the U.S. In the 1990s, we had a flip, and the U.S. significantly outperformed international. 2000s, it went back, and neither, neither of them did great, but the international did outperform a little bit. And then again, where we are right now, since or since 2009, is the U.S. stocks have significantly outperformed international. So this leads us really to believe we've continued to increase our international exposure over the last couple of years. As we think moving forward, the international market has more potential, is lower price than the U.S. market. This slide here covers what the equity market home bias by country. So essentially, no matter where you live, there seems to be a bias to thinking that your, your market is the best or you're, you, know, you buy the most of the companies from, from your country. Um, and so what this represents on the U.S., the U.S., of course, being the biggest market in the world, makes up 51% of the global economy right here. But the average U.S. investor 
has 79% of their stock exposure in the US and only 21% in the international markets. And again, very common with other countries. If you live in Canada, Canada only has a 3% global index weight, but they still believe in their country and a 59% invested in their country for the average investor. And Australia has the biggest kind of over number, 67% versus only 2% of the global index weight. So the good thing, of course, is being in the US, at least you do have the biggest economy, and so you're not kind of as out of whack as some of these other countries are. But what we've done, again, in the last couple of years is continue to increase our international exposure. So the average investor with us, instead of having 79% of the US, we've gotten the high 50%, and our international exposure is in the low 40%. Because again, we believe you have to be better diversified with international exposure. And this last one's a little overwhelming, so I'm not gonna go through the whole thing here. <laughs> but the reason I have it up here is what this shows is, is equity returns of the top markets over the last 20 years. And so each year from 1999 through 2018, the highest performing country market is up here, the lowest is down here. And in the 20 year period, the US has only been the number one right here in 2014. Other years, it's kind of all over the board. And so you just have to have that exposure to lots of different countries. Uh, and so when we talk about US versus international, it's not like we're talking about just investing in the US and Britain. We're talking about investing in tons of different economies. So we get exposure to lots of different stocks and lots of different markets. And then lastly, what we like to talk about is sometimes we get the question with allocation. You know, we believe in having a diversified allocation. Um, most portfolios are going to have what's there on the right, you know, a combination of U.S. stocks, international stocks, small company, mid company, uh, U.S. bonds, high yield bonds. Uh, but we sometimes look at the question, well, if we know the market's going to be up long term, which it always has been, why do I not just have U.S. stocks? Or why do I not just have stocks? And this, this slide, I think, will kind of help show that why diversification can feel disappointing, even though really in the long term, it does very well for you. So in the years 2000 and 2002, if you invested just in the S&P 500, you were down 37.6%. If you were in a diversified portfolio, you lost 5.6%. So you still weren't happy. So that, that person, you know, that's a sad face because I lost money. Now in 2003 to 2007, your diversified portfolio actually really did well. 61.2% in the four year periods, most people would be pretty happy with that. But when you see the S&P 500 was at 82.9, you kind of wonder, well, gee, why wasn't I all in stocks? So you're, you're happy, but not, not fully happy. 2008, of course, was the big market sell off The S&P 500 was down 37%. Diversified portfolio held up better, but still had a tough year, down 17.4%. So again, you have that frowny face because you've lost money. 2009 through 2017, we've had the incredible market since then. And so the diversified portfolio did very well. Again, up 152.2% in eight years is a good return. But people still think, gee, if I would have been all in stocks, it would have been up 258%. So they're not quite satisfied. And then 2018 was pretty similar no matter what you're in there with the S&P 500 down 4.4, diversified down 4.6. So again, I lost more money. But really, in the long run, if you put $100,000 in each of these portfolios back in the year 2000, the S&P 500 would be up 146.6%. You'd have $246,000. If you put it in a diversified portfolio, you'd be up 166% and I'd actually have 266,000. So diversification you know, wins even when it feels like it's losing. I have to get the question, well, that can't be possible because I've got the bigger returns. But essentially in the down years, like in 2000 and 2002, you lost $37,000 of your investment right there, and it takes a lot longer to make that up. Um, and so diversification is a good place to be. So with that, uh, John will come back up as well, and we'll be happy to take any questions that you have.